And I guess um, the first thing I want to say is welcome, and I hope that um, all of you and your loved ones are faring well as we um, hopefully are getting towards the end of this uh, difficult time. But thoughts and prayers for everybody. Um, and I think uh, it's a good uh, timely talk because I know for myself, gardening has really helped me a lot through the pandemic, both outside and inside gardening. So um, yeah, so welcome. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and just introduce myself. I am a person definitely addicted to gardening. Um, I um, am a master gardener um, and I can explain how that program works if anyone is interested. Um, but just because I'm a master gardener doesn't mean I, I know everything. It probably means that I have a better understanding of what I don't know. Um, but I do know that um, I love gardening both inside and out. This is the time of year when uh, people are really starting to do outside gardening. And um, there is crossover between the two, of course. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I am also an occupational therapist. Um, I currently work um, providing therapy for um, very young children in their families, uh, children who are at risk or have a a disability. Um, but I've worked with all ages and I enjoy doing horticulture therapy as well. So um, that's just a little bit about me. So um, tonight we, we just have an hour and um, you know I'm hoping to to cover just you know the basics and I'm sure we have people here with varied levels of experience. So um, bear with me, you know, we'll go over the basics and, um, you know, try to answer questions. I also, um, you know, really want to emphasize the unique needs of house plants, you know, why they're unique versus, you know, plants that we have outside and what are the best practices so that we can, you know, try to do better with our in-home plants. And I'm also going to talk just a little about the history of indoor gardening um, and how it kind of came to be, some of the trends, and talk about the health benefits of, of gardening, um, all kinds of gardening, but especially indoor gardening. So uh, that's a little bit about our, our focus. And if there's something that I'm not talking about that you want to be sure we cover, you know, definitely put it in the chat. Um, so houseplants are, are really good news. Um, it's been shown through research that they're good for your health, um, they're good for your soul, and having houseplants, um, having plants in the home is something people have enjoyed since ancient times. The Romans, the Babylons gathered plants and put them in earthenware pots. They had foliage plants. But it was really in Victorian England during the late 1800s um, that uh, houseplants really started to catch on. And it was really a hobby for the wealthy um, because people got special glass cases that they used uh, to put gardens in. And um, there was all more advances with central heating. Um, but the thing that's interesting about gardening is it's always uh, indoor gardening, houseplants, there's always changes in evolving trends that we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, this is one of my favorite um, pictures of kind of an indoor garden. I took it at the Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. This was the man that um, started Kodak. And um, this is kind of a a sunroom, I guess you could say, kind of an indoor outdoor, and it has a real Victorian flair to it with all the palms and the ferns. But apparently Mr. Eastman, a very wealthy man, he used to sit in here for all his meals. And it just, to me, it's just such a peaceful, healthy type feeling. And I just strive to have that kind of feeling in my house. Um, I don't have anything near like that, but I, I just think that it, it's really beautiful garden room. Um, so the next couple slides, we're gonna talk a little bit 
about the history and the trends. So one of the things that influenced um, indoor gardening uh, actually was a study that NASA did, the National Aeronautic um, NASA Space Agency. Um, they uh, were very interested in improving health in healthy air in small spaces because of like the space station and all of that. But they were pulled into a study that was organized by the Associated Landscape Contractors of America, um, where they were looking at buildings uh, during the energy crunch during the 70s and 80s that had been tightly closed in because we were trying to conserve energy and um, found that plants really could improve air quality. Um, and I did on the PowerPoint slide give you the, um, the link for that if you're interested in reading more about that study. It's, it's really, um, really interesting. Um, and you know, people in the buildings were getting like sick office syndrome. They, the, the quality of the air really was, was very poor. Um, so they were getting respiratory illnesses, headaches, and they found that certain plants um, helped with um, getting rid of some of the volatile chemicals that might be um, contained on the carpeting or in the furniture. And then of course, plants give off oxygen um, which is, is healthy for everyone. So um, that's, that's one of the reasons that houseplants became popular for offices as well. Um, another trend um, or, or a person I think that really contributed is, um, let me see, uh, uh, on this next slide, Dr. D.G. Hessian. Um, I have three of his books. He published these books in the UK. Um, Dr. Hessian is still alive, but he wrote three wonderful books um, that I have here. And I'm just gonna show you real quick because they're very um, interesting looking. This one is called The Houseplant Expert. Um, he has another one called The Indoor Plant Spotter. Um, and he has a third one, Be Your Own Houseplant Expert. This was his first book that he wrote. And these are in the reference list, but they're very readable, very well organized books that really helped people to get a handle on having plants inside. Um, so the, the, that was part of a, a trend. Um, also at that, at this time during the 60s and 70s, there was a lot more coverage, especially in women's magazines about the importance of home design and uh, plants. Uh, another part of the trend is when plastic pot, pots started to come on the market, instead of just clay pots, um, like a terracotta pot, when we started to have plastic pots, um, people sometimes were more successful uh, using those types of pots. Um, so it seemed at the end of the 20th century, um, plants were kind of starting to fall out of favor, house plants, except for like maybe older people. Um, but now in this new century, house plants are really, really hot. And especially according to research among the millennial uh, generation. Um, so millennials are really big into houseplants um, and, it, and a lot of research groups have tried to really identify why that is. Um, one reason uh, may be that it's something to nurture and have being a plant parent and having a sense of purpose and a connection with nature. Another reason is that um, social media. So people are able to decorate their home, their living place with plants and compare and show them off virtually. There's also a lot more support online for having plants. And there's trends um, like for clubs and groups in the evening to do decorating and arts and crafts with plants, um, succulents and all of that kind of thing. So 
we really do have a resurgence of interest in house plants. There's also a lot more interesting type plants available and a lot more information, and of course, on the internet. So all of those things have um, contributed to the interest in the upswing in, in house plants. The National Gardening Association said between 2016 and 2019, there was a 50% increase in sales of house plants. So, and I would venture to guess that during the pandemic, um, there probably has been a lot more sales of house plants um, because uh, in general, people were spending more money on their home, trying to make their space more comfortable. So, and plants certainly do that. So that's just a little bit about history and trends. And the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about the principles and practices um, for uh, taking care of your houseplant and being successful. So um, the first thing I want to say is kind of obvious, but I think um, we don't always think about it. A houseplant is something we capture and put in a container and keep in our house. It didn't start out in a house. It has a natural environment where it came from, where it thrived. So one of the first things that I try to do is when I get a new plant or I'm thinking about buying a plant, I try to understand where it grows and thrives naturally. Um, <clears throat> if I learn that it survives on the jungle floor in a very humid environment, or if it grows you know, in a, in a rocky, very hot, dry area, those tell me things about the kind of environment that it might do, it would do better in within my home. The other thing is that um, by virtue of the fact that we're putting a living plant in a pot, we're limiting its contact with the natural environment that provide it with the nutrients and the, the water and um, the organisms that it needs. So we have to understand all of that. So each plant, they're all individual. Um, they need a certain amount of light. All plants need some sort of light for energy and growth. And remember, um, thinking about biology, plants really eat light. That, through photosynthesis, through their leaves, that is what drives their physiology. So the light is really essential. And bigger leaf plants have more surface to take the light in than really smaller leaf plants, obviously. So um, sometimes it's a little bit of a clue that a larger leaf plant might be able to survive with less light because it has more surface available. We'll talk more about that. But um, also plants, uh, all plants need water of some sort, um, but it's variable. And we're going to talk a little bit about how water uh, really kills more plants um, than anything else, because we kind of kill it with kindness. We think it must need more water if it's not doing well, but actually too much water, we can drown the plant because the roots will rot. So it, yes, it needs water and humidity, but we have to know how much and when, and that depends on the time of year and a few other factors. Um, every plant has cer certain temperature parameters, day and evening temperature parameters. Um, I mentioned humidity. Um, what is one thing that we lose in our homes during the winter time when we turn the heat on? Humidity. And uh, that's going to be an important factor and we'll talk about how to create more humidity. We also need to be aware of what we put in the plant, uh, in the pot, the potting medium. Um, and it's not going to be soil from outside, from our garden. It, a lot of times it's soil-less mix. We have to be very mindful of what we use. And fertilization is part um, Fertilization isn't really to feed the plant, it's to give it some, some more of the nutrients that it needs, a little bit different than the light. Um, so the first thing, and it's hard, 
but you have to think about your space before you go shopping for plants. And I know I do it too. I'm in a store, I like a plant, and maybe I haven't thought about where I'm gonna put it. But if you can, analyze your space first, and we'll talk about how to do that. <clears throat> before we talk about that, we're gonna talk about containers. Um, it's really important. It adds to the beauty of the plant, but there's also properties of the container that are really important to think about. Um, so the clay type, the terracotta that I have here, they come in various sizes. And these are wonderful for plants and can provide a very natural look. However, they pull the moisture from the plant. Um, so we have to realize in a terracotta plant, it's going to need to be checked more for water. And a good rule of thumb is before you plant your plant in a terracotta pot, you can soak the terracotta pot in water for a couple of hours so it gets its need for moisture filled and it doesn't immediately pull all the moisture from the plant. Um, pots also come obviously in plastics. Um, they come in other types of ceramic. Um, one very important point is that your pot must have a drainage hole. Um, the, the pot that's going to house the plant has to have a hole for drainage. If you want to use a pot that doesn't have a hole, like right now this one doesn't, that can be an outside catch pot, but you have to immediately have the plant in something with holes and drainage. Otherwise, the moisture will all collect and it can rot the roots. Um, rocks in the bottom don't really do it. It might help a little with the drainage, but you really need to have that uh, freedom. Um, also, you want to look at the shape. You really want to have a flare more at the top, or at least straight up and down. You, you wouldn't want to have one that gets narrower because it would be really hard to remove that plant. And the size, um, you want to be mindful of the size of your plant and the size of the pot. Um, obviously, you don't want it to be too small and root bound. And if you if you put in a small plant in a big pot, it will get lost in there and it won't get the moisture and the nutrients the roots need because there's too much space. <clears throat> so usually when we go up a size, we go up just to the next size of pot, like from a four inch to a six inch. So, and we'll talk a little more about that. but. Do pay attention to the container, what it's made of, and think about how you want to, you know, the aesthetics, how you want it to enhance the beauty, the natural beauty of the plant. You can use things like baskets and uh, other um, household items, teapots and all that as an outside pot, um, but make sure you have the plant itself in something with drainage and make sure if you use a basket or whatever that it's lined so it's you know waterproof. <clears throat> so the purpose of the potting medium or the soil as we call it, um, it has a lot of functions for the plant. First and foremost, it anchors the roots of the plant um, and it can hold the water and allow the excess to drain um, depending on what you add to the comp, we tend to call it like a compost mix. If you um, add a lot of organic material and make it a very rich mix, it will hold water more. Um, if we add more sand and perlite, it'll drain more quickly and more easily. And you have to match that up with the plant. So like succulents, uh, cacti, I have a little uh, cactus here. They want a very dry, sandy uh, mixture because um, they store um, water in their leaves. Sorry about that phone, just letting it ring. Um, and if it had uh, 
a richer mix, it would really rot the roots. Um, other type plants like a richer um, uh, compost mix that holds on to the water. So you're you're good really with getting in the store like a uh, you can get a general purpose organic potting mixture, and um, I usually add to that a little perlite. Um, if I wanted to have a richer mix, I might add some peat moss um, or some uh, uh, organic fine bark um, to get it a little more dense. And then sometimes you can add sand to it, or you can just buy a cacti succulent mix. <laughs> but it's important to realize that we have to have spaces in the soil. Uh, outside, those spaces are created by worms and other biological stuff in the soil. But the roots need oxygen uh, as well as moisture and water. Um, when plants become too compact <clears throat> and the soil is so solid that the water's just flowing through, we have to repot it. Um, and usually the spring is a good time to repot. Um, I'm going to do a couple more slides and then we'll stop for questions before we continue. So watering is really a critical point. We want to be wary about water. Um, we want to water our plants and this goes for outside plants too, thoroughly, but sometimes not as frequent as we might think. Most plants like to dry out in between um, watering. Some like to dry out completely, others like to dry out just on the top. Um, there's really, shouldn't really be a schedule for watering we should water it based on what we observe and see. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But when you do water a plant, the ideal thing is to water it until water passes out of the bottom so that you know that you've, got, you've done it thoroughly. Um, sometimes what you can do is take the whole uh, inside you know, pot and submerge it in water until everything gets moist and then take it out and put it back in the catch pot. But we have to check, you don't ever wanna let a plant sit in water because that can um, rot the roots. So the best way to tell if your plant needs to be water, watered is check with your finger and reach down towards the roots and feel whether it's moist or, or damp or if it's completely dry. Um, you can also get to know how much your plant generally weighs. Um, if it's really dry, you'll notice that it's really light. Um, you also want to periodically dibble the soil, like with a with a fork or like a little, you know, something just to to try to keep those air spaces. Um, let's see. So, uh, how do we know how much water our plant needs? Well. When you, when you bring a plant home, the first thing that you wanna do is um, put that plant in like a, just a kind of a shady area. Don't put it, if it's a plant that needs sun, don't put it immediately in the sun. Just put it somewhere and keep it isolated from your other plants because you never know if you're gonna have some pests or a disease. So keep it isolated. In the meantime, read about your plant. Go online to a, you know, a reputable site and read about the plant, what it's called, and what are some of the descriptions of what the plant needs. Where does it live naturally? <coughs> and um, if, if, they, if they tell you that the plant needs ample water or it needs, it likes to be moist, then you really want to water it when the top like is dry, um, you know, it's, it's pretty dry for about a half inch, then it might start to feel moist, but the top has started to dry out. Um, something that needs a moderate amount of water, you wanna wait till it's, it's dry for about an inch, but also reach down to the root and if it's really moist down there, wait a little bit. And then um, a plant low water, you really wanna wait till it dries out a couple inches um, 
before you, you water it. Um, it's really important to really get to know your, your plant, be a really good observer, um, take in the plant with all of your senses. What does it look like when it seems to be thriving? What does it feel like? Um, get to know the color of the leaves and all of that so that you can see changes over time. <clears throat> um, watering is a practice that we should start to be increasing now with the spring through into the fall. We really cut back on watering most house plants over the winter time because most plants go into like a dormancy period in the winter. It doesn't mean we don't water them, but we might, we, we, we cut back. Now plants are starting to kick into um, their growth period and we need to be, you know, watering them more, checking them more. Um, we're also gonna talk about fertilizing and fertilizing is something that we, might do in the spring and once in the summer. We don't do it during the dormant period. So what are some signs about um, plants if they're too dry or too wet? Sometimes they can look the same if they're over dry or over wet. Well, dry, the plant kind of looks like it's wilting or drooping. It kind of turns a lot of times grayish green and um, <coughs> It will drop, especially the older leaves off. If a plant has too much moisture, it tends to turn more yellow and it can start to lose all its leaves. Those are just some general principles. Um, <clears throat> in terms of water, we want to use, um, at the very least, water out of the tap that you let settle a little bit, like draw the water tonight in your watering can and water it in the morning. So some of the um, the soluble salts and, and other chemicals can kind of settle to the bottom. Ideally, if you can collect rainwater, that's great, or mineral free water. The tap water is fine. Just let it settle and do it, you know, and also let it get to room temperature. It's always better to water plants in the morning. So, so that if any of the foliage and stuff gets wet, you have a chance, it has a chance to sort of evaporate off. <laughs> and use a watering um, can that has like a, a narrow spout because you're watering the medium, the compost, the soil, not the foliage. And again, as I said, water it until it runs out the bottom and don't let the pot sit in water. Um, all right, let me stop and see if there are questions and then we'll we'll keep going. Nicole? Yes, um, so I don't see anything in the chat. Um, if anybody has anything, you know, put it in the chat um, and we can, we can ask during this break. Um, I will say I suddenly understand why some of my plants haven't been thriving. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, anybody, anybody have any questions for me? We can also do it at the end, you know. Um, sure. All right, well, feel free to let me know if you want me to stop. Right, um, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't see anything. Um, okay. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, you know, um, some, Andrea just said, I don't have any questions, but this is helpful, but I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Um, but yeah, as we as we continue, just if anything comes up, guys, just drop them in and, and we'll get to them at the end, I promise, all right? All right, we're good? Cool. So um, humidity is, is a really important um, principle, especially in the winter time, that um, the water, uh, as we water the plant, it moves through the roots and the leaves and then it, it goes off, you know, it, it goes off into vapor when there's more humidity <laughs> this process slows down when the air is really dry it speeds it up um, and that's when we turn the heat on when plants are too close to the heat so the principle that i've really learned that i like is um, grouping plants uh, closer together <laughs> not so close that you know they um, 
could share a disease or whatever if, if one is not healthy, but putting plants together helps to increase the humidity. Also, <coughs> if your plant needs um, a humidity boost, you can bring it into the bathroom, in the shower. You could also put some you know, plastic over it, almost like a terrarium effect to increase the humidity. Um, you can use a humidifier. It's just that, you know, you'd have to, you know, put it on a lot and close to the plants to increase the humidity and, you know, turning the heat down. Some people use a pebble tray. You can put the plants on pebbles and put water in the pebbles and then put the plant pot on top. Just make sure that the wa the plant isn't sitting directly in the water, but that can increase the humidity around the plants. <clears throat> plants do also need um, to be uh, fertilized, but not when we first repot them, um, because most of the uh, commercial compost that we use has fertilizer in it. But um, if you repotted your plant, say last fall, and then come the spring or a year ago, now is the time to be fertilizing. And um, I just recommend getting, you know, a general um, fertilizer. And I tend to try to use it at 50% strength of what they say. Um, that's just, I, I would rather under than over. And I like to use the liquid that you just add right to water. If you stick those spikes in, it just gets certain areas of the plant. And sometimes the little sprinkle things don't absorb. So I think for house plants, um, adding it that way is, is, a, is the best bet. <clears throat> and remember, we're gonna do it spring, you know, through autumn, but once like October comes and we set, we change the time, we don't really want to be fertilizing most plants uh, during that time. Um, now, light is is a key. Um, you we really want to take a look at your living space or your office, wherever you want to have plants, and figure out south, east, north, and west. So obviously, the south um, is the area with. Um, oh, sorry the highest um, intensity of light. And um, most plants can't tolerate that direct south window in the windowsill during the hot summer. They can during the winter time, but you really gotta be careful. You might have to put like um, a something up just to give it a little bit of filter or back it away, a sheer curtain or back it away a little bit. The south is good for succulents, like uh, geraniums. Um, I have a jade plant that does really well in the south window, uh, but be, um, be careful seeds as they're progressing along. Um, east and west are ideal for, for plants. Um, it's medium light, uh, but remember that the west can be very hot during the afternoon, especially in the summer. The north is the lowest light, um, and it it can work for some plants, but uh, you know that's the lowest uh, light. Um, we also know that plants are sometimes labeled as needing indirect light. It's bright light in a, a brightly lit room, but never in direct sun. Um, we can filter through uh, curtains, Venetian blinds. Be mindful if there's a tree outside your house. Um, if you paint the room white uh, or have a mirror, that's going to help with the light. And also clean windows, especially in the wintertime, will help give it more light. Um, it's important to rotate the plant uh, because some plants will, many plants will grow towards the light. So we, we have to turn to get um, to keep the growth even. Um, it's important to realize how quickly the intensity of the light decreases as we move away from the light source. It's, uh, it's 
just quickly inverse square law. So a plant that's two feet from a window gets 25% of the light, two squared is four or 25%. So it really rapidly decreases, which sometimes is, is what you want, but other times, you know, you need to get it closer or in the window. Um, the light's going to be less intense when you're hanging a plant than if it's coming down at it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, generally, um, uh, there are plants that are flower or you want to flower tend to need more of the bright light than our foliage plants. We can also use artificial light. Myself, I've been trying to learn more about artificial light. Um, remembering that uh, plants need something called PAR. Um, they need many spec, many um, colors of light. And we don't see all of that, uh, but each of the variants is responsible for different functions in the plant. So white light is full spectrum. We perceive it as white. Uh, but you can get lights that are specific, like a red light that would help with flowering and fruiting. Um, but what I really recommend is um, using like the fluorescent, like the shop lights, that's broad spectrum and that's intense. Um, you can for example, during the winter time, put plants like in the basement under a fluorescent light, and that would be really helpful. There's also LED lights now. They're they're newest and they're very efficient, um, but you have to use them usually for a longer period of time. We don't want to use regular light bulbs, incandescent lights. They would be too hot and they would burn the foliage. The fluorescent lights are um, not going to have the heat, uh, so they're not going to burn. I do have a book in the reference list about artificial lighting in plants. So um, I just got my eye on the, the clock here. Time goes so fast. Um, the other thing we want to think about is the temperature range. Um, many of us think that plants like it hot, and that's really not true. Uh, plants need a, a evening temperatures to be cool. Um, they need to cool off um, 10 to 15 degrees lower than the day. And really most plants can't really survive in much higher than 85 degrees. The reason they can do well in, in a um, greenhouse is because they have a lot of humidity and percolating uh, air. So um, these are some temperature ranges, uh, you know, for plant. And again, when you're reading about and getting to know your plant, uh, you want to you want to learn about what's what kind of light it needs and what is the temperature range. Uh, remembering that daytime, the east facing window is going to be cooler, and the west facing is going to be more intense, higher temperature. Succulents like this, but other plants it may be too intense, especially in the summer. Um, if the temperature is too high at night for plants in the winter wintertime, um, that's not good. The plant needs to be able to cool off at night. Um, now, this time of year, we're thinking about our, our plants, our house plants, can they go outside? And is it good for them to go outside? Yes. Uh, many plants benefit from uh, house plants from going outside during the summertime, but you've got to do it carefully. You don't want to put a plant that's been inside under protective conditions out in the bright hot sun. Find a protected kind of shadier place for it outside. Um, plants do can get sunburned um, and do it gradually. Um, you can uh, allow the rain, you know, to clean it and all of that, uh, but make sure that when you bring it back in, you thoroughly inspect the plant for insects and all of that before bringing it back into your home. So um, the point of what I've been saying is analyze your living space before 
you shop for plants and try to choose the right plant for the right place, just like outside. Um, so when you're going to buy a plant, you really want to be a detective in the store. First of all, you want to buy from a reputable place. Um, you want to, you don't want to go to a place that only has a few plants that they never turn over. You want plants that, um, you know, they're doing a good business and these plants haven't been sitting on the shelf. Um, check it, look for any signs that it just doesn't look healthy. It's, it, there seems like there's insects or disease, you know, wilting foliage. If it's really spindly growth, um, don't be afraid. Look at the bottom. You don't want to buy a plant that's really root bound and the, and the roots are hanging, you know, out of the bottom. Um, transport it carefully, especially in the winter time. Watch out that it doesn't, you know, get too cold. Wrap it up. Um, and quarantine it for several days when you first bring it home. Gradually expose it to the light. If it's a, if it's a full sun, a plant that you want to put like in an east or a west window or even in the south, do that gradually. Don't all of a sudden because it, it just has to acclimate um, gradually. The only um, thing that you'd want to do that with is if you bought a flowering Say you went to Trader Joe's and you bought one of their flowering rose type plants that you could put it's a temporary flowering plant you could put it in the in the uh, in the sun right away. Um, and when you bring a plant in from outside, you can also wash it off with some um, insecticidal or, or uh, soap for the plant. So there's different types of plants that we can have inside. Some people choose um, plants for their beautiful foliage. And these types of plants we can enjoy year long in our house. Um, plants like begonia, which is the one on my right, probably your left, um, for the beautiful foliage. Sometimes they flower. Um, the peperomia here in the middle. Th this one over on the left is a calathea, absolutely beautiful foliage type plants. And these um, can be bushy, some of them grow upright, we can have foliage plants that trail or climb. So those are some properties that we can enjoy year round. We can have flowering house plants. The African violet in the middle or the St. Paulia. Um, on my right, the orange, the clivia, and on the other side is a hoya. Um, and some of them flower um, once a year or twice a year, given the right care. Others flower, you know, more frequently. But these are house plants that that do flower. Um, there's also uh, plants that are called like florist. Um, house plants so that they flower like the rose I was talking about. It's going to flower for you, but then you're going to have to put it outside like um, primroses or um, cyclamen. They're, they're beautiful and they do flower, but usually we have to get them outside for that to continue. Whereas these types of plants, even geraniums, you can keep it permanently in your house and have it be flowering. Succulents are, are another a wonderful type of indoor plant um, that would be like the aloe, the kalinkoe, uh, I think this one is the echeveria. They're, they're just beautiful and they don't need obviously a lot of water uh, either. Um, we do need to repot um, a plant. We have to repot it if it's root bound if you see that the roots are going around and around and the plant is uh, just, just stuck, um, we usually want to go up to another size pot or we want to trim the roots and keep it in the same container, but we would have to know what we were doing to trim the roots to, to keep it there. Um, so usually up to a two inch larger and um, let it recuperate a little bit after you've repotted it. Uh, there are some plants that do like to stay in a cramped quarters. 
a Hoya is one of those. That it just likes to be crowded. Also the Christmas cactus. How do I know these things? By reading about them, by experience, not, um, you, you don't just know it, but you, you learn about that. So these are just some pictures of, of plants to kind of illustrate some points. This is a north window in my house. It's also, these, are, these windows are going north, but there also are other windows in the room. But ferns are happy here. <laughs> because they don't they don't need a lot of light um so that's a good spot for them uh, uh over here on the side there are succulents and a geranium in a south facing window as well as um citrus and that they can really benefit from that full sun i had um some geraniums that i had outside and I took cuttings and brought them in and kept them in a south window and they flowered beautifully all winter long. Um, so these are, again, uh, ferns, foliage plants. They like high humidity. Uh, the north window, east or west, is also okay. Um, this is a, a Norfolk pine that likes um, a north window. Uh, bright indirect light and it likes uh, a rich soil. It likes to hold on to the moisture a bit and it likes cool night temperatures. Um, everybody, uh, you know, we, we have to talk about, you know, pests and things that can go wrong. <clears throat> the first and most important thing is that overwatering, underwatering, um, root bound, um, not enough humidity, improper care puts the plant in a stressed position and then it's more likely to attract um, pests. So the number one thing to avoid pests is to try to learn about the plant, get to know it, and make sure you're trying to provide the right amount of light, the right amount of water, humidity, temperature, all of those things first. Um, and then inspect your plant. You can take a magnifying glass and look. And if you see bugs, um, like on the bottom of the leaves, you might have spider mites or mealy bugs. There's all these specifics. Um, so it can get that that can happen. And we can use a um, a soap, or we can you know just try to clean the leaves off. Um, we can have a fungus. Uh, we can also have a bacterial infection. So it's hard in the context of this session really to go over all of that. So I guess the main thing I want to say is try to have good care of the plant um, and that will avoid a lot of these problems. Also um, make sure to isolate your plant from your other collection when you first bring it home look at it closely before you purchase it. And when you bring plants indoors from being out in the summer, wash it, check for larger pests, check under the leaves. Um, and there's lots of ways to decorate your home with plants. Um, you can use miniature gardens uh, to put you know, plants together. You can use you know, window boxes, um, you can do terrariums. Um, there's so many ways to group and to, to decorate your home with plants. Different plant stands, that's one that I, that I have. Um, there's different ways to be creative. Um, that's not my house, but I've seen these windows where people have, especially the St. Pauli of African violets. I think that's so beautiful. Um, and then I have some references here. There are so many wonderful books on, um, on house plants, but uh, I just put some of my favorites here. And I wanted to emphasize that any books that I've mentioned, I have absolutely no interest in the authors or any connection to anybody. I'm just recommending things that I've found helpful in the here. Also, you can call the Master Gardeners in Middlesex County. There's a helpline 
with specific problems. And then I really recommend podcasts. And these are three that I really like. Um, the first two are specifically about houseplants. On the Ledge is from the UK, Jane Perrone. And she's really funny. And if you go on her website, you'll see um, all, she has them for years. They're sometimes on specific plants, sometimes on um, general principles. And then Bloom and Grow Radio is um, a young, youngish woman, and she's really appealing um, to uh, new, she calls them plant, uh, planty parents, but it's packed full of great information um, about houseplants. And then the Joe Gardner show, he's a great uh, gar gardener outside, especially vegetable gardening, but he also has um, episodes on, on houseplants. And then I just have two more slides to show and then we'll have time for questions. This is um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension from where I am a master gardener. They wanted me to make sure um, that everyone's aware of their Are You Ready to Garden podcasts, uh, not podcasts, but uh, like this webinars. The next one's coming up, um, I guess that's this week on Thursday, but they have past episodes recorded. Uh, we did stuff all winter and in the spring on outside gardening. And then um, a little advertisement for farmers markets um fresh produce in new jersey that'll be coming soon too so um now i'm open for questions i i'm sorry if i just went really really fast there near the end i became aware of the time and wanted to make sure that i covered everything but i'll be glad to try to answer any questions okay let me pull up the chat here um all right so joanne asked uh, my soil has a grayish layer on top. The plant is not doing well. Should I attempt to move it to another plot with new soil? If so, what is the best way to do this? And what did you say that was a Hoya? Uh, doesn't say what type of plant it is. Oh, it just says your her. Can you just read it again? The question. My plant. Sorry, I dropped my mic. Um, my soil has a grayish layer on top. Uh, she says it's a prayer plant. Oh, a prayer plant. Okay. Uh, my soil has a grayish layer on top. The plant is not doing well. Should mm -hmm. I attempt to move it to another plot with new soil? If so, what is the best way to do this? Yeah, well, I think um, taking it out of the pot and inspecting it is is a really good idea. And it sounds like, you know, you've never repotted it. I don't know how long you've had it. But yes, I would I would bring it over to an area of the kitchen sink and I would um, maybe take a knife and, you know, gently go around and, you know, slide the plant, plant out and look at the roots. Look and see if it's really root bound. Look to see if the roots are, are kind of moldy or do they look, you know, uh, healthy. Um, and then if it seems like it's, it's really tight in there, you can go to a pot you know, two inches bigger and get yourself some potting mix, uh, maybe add a little perlite to it or just the potting mix that you buy at the store probably has enough perlite. Um, fill it partly and then, you know, make sure you have a good container that has drainage. And before you put the plant in, moisten the roots, kind of work with the roots a little bit and, um, yeah, I'll plant it in. It's hard to say what that gray is. It might be some residue from the water. If it's like a soluble salt, it could be a pest. Uh, it could be mold. I'm really not sure. But I think the first thing you want to do is, is take it out and really have a look <clears throat> and see what's going on. I know I have my prayer plant um, in kind of a west facing window. I'm going to be careful as the weather gets hotter. But um, it needs it needs light, but it doesn't <clears throat> doesn't belong like in a south window or anything like that. I hope that helps. It sounds pretty like pretty solid plan. Um, Marianne Marianne asks, 
how much sun do cacti need and how often should they be watered? How much sun do what need? Uh, cacti, cactus, plants? Cactus, okay. So, so cactus, um, they can survive, you know, they like uh, hot, dry conditions. So they can be in a south facing or um, a west facing or east facing window. They can even be outside in the summer. Just be careful you don't put it in too hot sun right away or it'll get sunburned. And um, they really don't need a lot of water because they store the water in their leaves. Um, but if it starts like with a, a succulent plant when the leaves start to look a little shriveled, I, I give it water and water it thoroughly. Um, cacti, I don't, there's so many different types of cacti, but I have this little cacti here and I give it just a little bit of water maybe every few weeks, but it really doesn't, doesn't need much water at all. So yeah, you know, succulents, they, they tend to store the water. Remember, they live in like the desert, hot and dry. They don't want humidity. You don't want humidity with the succulents. That is not what you want. Hot and dry, they like, you know, the, they live in like rocky, sandy soil. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, Christine wants to know, how do I prevent brown edges on plant leaves? brown edges on plants. Well, it, it, it kind of depends on the cause. It could be that the brown edges are because it's getting a little bit burned. It may be in a west facing window that it gets too hot and it kind of burns a little bit. Maybe you want to pull it back from the window a little bit or rotate it. Um, <coughs> it also might be that it's missing uh, a nutrient. I don't know how often that's been fertilized, um, but the brown edges sometimes are from being scorched. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what the brown edges are for, but take a look at what the plant is, where you have it positioned, um, and um, the watering schedule, make sure that you have it um, in a pot with drainage, try to go back to all the basic principles. And if a leaf is really scorched, you know, trim it, you know, take it off and, and um, so, but I don't know exactly what the brown edges, you know, that could be from several reasons. Okay. Um, Marianne also wants to know, uh, what's the best way to propagate succulents? Um, yeah, succulents are um, plants that you really, you really can propagate. And um, a lot of times they grow like a little pup, a little shoot off the side. And usually what I do is I, I take it off, I make a, a clean cut, I leave some of the stem. <clears throat> and then you, you need to let that callus over a little bit, they say two or three days. And then you can put that into like some peat moss or sandy mixed. I'm not exactly sure what's the best recommendation, but check on that, what you should put it in. I've read peat and I've also read like a sandy mixture, but usually it will take hold and it will start to grow on its own. Um, some succulents, uh, you have to take a leaf off and you can stick that right back in the soil. It's really good to just try to read a little bit, find out which particular plant you have and read a little more about propagating. But sometimes it's with the leaf, sometimes it's the, the actual pup that is formed and sometimes it's a stem cutting. Interesting. Um... Another question, hyacinth plant, hyacinth plant seemed full bloom when I bought it two weeks ago, but now all the flowers are drying off. I have the pots next to a window and I water daily. Yep, yeah, so a hot, that's what's gonna happen with a hyacinth plant. It's, um, it's one of those plants that 
it's going to be temporary. You're going to buy it. It's going to be beautiful and smell beautiful. And then the flower is going to die. Um, and then you're going to have left a bulb. And you can take that bulb and plant it outside. And if, you know, possibly, hopefully next spring it will come up again. But the, the flower is not going to last no matter what you do. If you go, if you were to drive by my house, you'd see I have some hyacinths outside in the garden. They bloom and then the flowers die and the foliage stays and it takes in the, the sun and restores energy to the bulb. So really the best thing you could do right now probably is um, take that potted plant and set it, set it outside and let the, let the sun, uh, let the bulb get restored um, with the sun into the leaves. And then, you know, you can try to plant that. Some people would just dispose of it. It's, it's not a permanent plant that you're going to have in your house. It's kind of a temporary, just like tulips. If we buy a pot of tulips, we're going to enjoy them in the house, but then they're going to, they're going to die. And you can either throw it away or you can save the bulbs and plant them outside. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, another question, how do you prevent the yellowing of leaves? Instead of browning, yellow leaves? Yeah, so yellowing can either be too much water or not enough water. <clears throat> Most times it's too much water. And so you really want to see if you feel down at the roots and see if it's got too much. Um, the roots might be drowning it or it may be that it needs uh, something that it's not getting, that it hasn't been fertilized in a long time. Um, this time of year, you could do one of two things. You could repot it with some new soil that would have some fertilizer right in it, or <coughs> you can um, give it a little bit of fertilizer. So it may be overwatering, and it may be that it's it's missing uh, it needs to be, you know, fertilized. Okay. Um, that's the last one at the moment. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Um, so in regards to the hyacinth, shouldn't you remove the depleted bloom so energy goes to the bulb for next year? Um, shouldn't you remove the depleted? Yes. Um, you can remove the depleted blooms, let them die away gradually, and then the energy is going to go in uh, to the leaves and feed the, the, the bulb for next year. Yes, that, that's correct, what the person said, yes. Um, anybody else? I just wanna say, again, thank you so much. This has been extremely, extremely informative and helpful. Um, yeah, is there any, any, do you like to leave us with any closing remarks? Um, I, I just wanna say, hold on, let me, um, let me stop sharing and I'll get myself back. Um, oh gosh, I'm so dark there now. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody. And, um, you know, it's um, a, a, a process of just experimenting and learning. Um, and it just, it seems to me like the more that you learn, the more you realize what you don't know. Don't be afraid of killing a plant. Uh, that'll happen and then you learn from it. Um, <laughs> read, use resources. It's a wonderful hobby that you can, you know, always be learning and growing and, you know, just enjoy it. Enjoy the companionship of plants and enjoy making your house look nice from the plants or your office or, or um, wherever you're going to use them. Well, I don't have anything else besides much thanks happening in the chat. Um, okay, good. So thank, thank you everybody. so much for this program. I'm sorry um, about my, my voice. I started, I didn't realize I'd start to, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, it's not good. <laughs> no, it was great. Um, thank you again. Um, okay. You know, this is extremely, extremely informative. I definitely appreciate it. I'm pretty sure everybody else did too. And thank you guys for coming. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. See you in the garden shop. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Let's see.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Daryl. <coughs> Thanks, 